Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Health Advantage podcast. I am Giacomo, I'm your host, and today I'm going to do the second part of the Atomic Habits um, podcast episode. We did part one last time and I thought it was the case for me to to continue and to deliver the, the second part and the final part where we cover the rest of, of the useful parts of the book that I hope you can all take with you. Um, So we finished off um, on the feedback loops on episode one, uh, and if you didn't, haven't worked there and you heard it and you listened to it, go back and refer back to it because I think in all honesty there was, there was a lot of value and there are a lot of things very, very useful and great in this book and um, things that we can all take away. I definitely took away a lot of them and um, that was mainly one of the reasons why I wanted to to share those with you as well. And as I said, there were so many things that uh, I thought was going to be better to share in two, in two different episodes at least rather than um, cram it all at once. So um, starting off the next uh, and the second part, um, uh, it's important to discuss like why do we create habits? And I think this, um, this is something that the auto does pretty well. Um, habits are essentially created as a part of the, as a way for the brain to uh, interact with our, with our reality. Um, and it begins always with trial and error. Um, so when we present the brain with something new, um, it responds with it responds to it like with a with a respond outward response to this. It's essentially asking itself how to how to deal with the situation. Um, so again, this is the quote from the book. Habits are simply reliable solutions recurring problems in our environment uh, and obviously when we change environment when we change problems then you know we are also inclined to um change the habits or the inter- the interpretation of the habits that we used to have a list so habit formation is incredibly useful because the conscious mind again is working to preserve attention and to whatever the task we consider being most most important most essential uh, and again, this is something that we do automatically. So again, we don't really have, um, uh, we don't really decide in every moment, in every in every action that we take, which one is the most essential, something that comes automatic to us. And habits are the four essential for us to um, free up space, um, have more mental capacity, and essentially have more energy. And habits create freedom because if we are not, uh, if if our habits are not in check, obviously we, we will always we will always be struggling. Okay, and we'll cover this a bit more in depth as we as we continue to discuss this the second part. So the process of habits building is divided into four phases, um, and again, this is something that the, the author takes back from the other book, uh, which is again awesome awesome book. Uh, I'm I'm cannot recommend enough. It's called The Power of Habit. Mm-hmm. So the process of building habits comes in four phases, cue, craving, response, and finally the reward. So the cue obviously initiated initiates a behavior towards a certain reward. Uh, the cravings are the second step and are based on the on, on the desire behind a certain habit. Um, and without the craving for change, there is no reason for us to act in any circumstances and in any ways, really. And the response is then the actual habit that we perform either in the form of a thought or of or, or an action. Uh, and finally, this response delivers a reward. And rewards are the end goal or, uh, the end goal of every habit. We choose rewards, um, sorry, we chase rewards, sorry, for two reasons. Yeah, one, they satisfy us, and two, they teach us. Um, so together, these four steps form what is called the neurological feedback loop. And again, every time we go through the same through the same loop so if we want and when we want to change a behavior we can simply start with this um asking ourselves these four questions how can i make something obvious how can i make something attractive how can i make it something easy and how can i make it something satisfying and this is something that the water goes on and in and develop into four different laws of being and change so again make it obvious make it attractive make it easy and make it satisfying um, so essentially, we need to make a specific plan so that when you when you state 
and um, when you said when and where you will perform in your ambit, you are more likely to to follow through. Uh, but again, too many people, and again, I am also uh, and I've also been guilty of this. Try to change our habits without um, without having essentially a figure out a plan before, and I mean without having the, the details figured out before. Okay, because we all say, for example, I want to be healthier or I want to exercise more, but we leave it up to chance and hope that we will remember at some point uh, to do it, or uh, we hope that we will feel motivated at the right time in the right place to actually execute what we plan on executing and what we want to execute. So what we think more often than not is simply <clears throat> lack of motivation, but in reality is a lack of clarity, because as I said, we haven't figured out the specific actions that we need to take, and it is not obvious um, where and when we will take these actions. Um, so one of the strategies that the author goes down in and uh, suggests to us um, is called habit stacking, um, and it's basically a consequence of the um, of the Diderot effect. Now, I'm not gonna go into the specifics of, so essentially, actually, no, let's explain why it's called Diderot effect. So um, Diderot essentially was a was a writer um, that despite his um, in very well um, established knowledge and um, ability as a writer, uh, was not really um, in good economic conditions up until the point where uh, I don't remember who exactly, or from maybe in the in the royal family at the time in France, um, decided to um, hire him essentially, and um, to pay him a lot of money. And what what happened is that Diderot went from having nothing to having all this spare money, and he essentially decided to buy one thing after the other. <laughs> Uh, and that's what and that's what's been called essentially the Diderot effect. The Diderot effect is when we go off to buy something and then we buy the other thing and another thing and another thing and we end up we end up leaving the house thinking we're gonna buy one thing and we come back um having bought ten or fifteen things and that can happen online now too obviously with Amazon and all the other things that you know they they um suggest your purchase after the other. Uh, so I found something that we've probably all been guilty of as well at some point or another. Uh, and so the the author takes this example and transforms it into habit stacking, saying that essentially one of the best way to build a new habit is to do is to identify essentially what we're already doing um, each day, and then we can try and stack a behavior on top of it. Um, and this is either like during current routines or after current routines, for example, if we want to, again, this is an example that I also makes in the book, if we want to start reading a bit more at night before going to bed or as we are in bed before going to sleep, what, we might, what our routine might look like is that we wake up, we make a bed and we go have breakfast or we go have a shower, for example. And if we want to, as I said, start reading more at night before going to sleep, the change a routine might mean might look like something like this so we wake up we make the bed we place the book that we want to read on the pillow uh, and then we go on and have a shower or breakfast or whatever is next and funny enough that made me laugh because i a few months ago I bought a kindle and i literally leave the kindle next to my bed and this is this is something that i was doing before with my ipad too because i started reading um ebooks kind of like around a year ago or a year something ago uh, and it was extremely, extremely more use, more easy for me to read uh, every night before going to sleep, actually. And I, this is something that I do every night, basically, just because my, my iPad, as I said before, and my Kindle now uh, are always next to my bed. So essentially, like, it's impossible for me to not do it. <laughs> and it's also something I enjoy doing. So obviously, I'm a bit more facilitated for that case, too. But again, it's something that has definitely made it much easier. Um, because you know, before, for example, uh, how I, I I needed to have a, a light next to the bed, a light that was strong enough for me to be able to read, but not too strong that did not disrupt my sleeping 
and also not strong enough to disrupt my girlfriend sleeping too. So again, as you can see that the little things will still be into place. And then again, there, there are different solutions and different problems. But again, the more you make something easy for you, and this is something one of the one of the one of the rules that the that the authors speak about, and one of the things I mentioned before. Um and the more you incorporate it to your routine, the easier it will be for you to, to stick to it. Um so then another important part that we need to talk about is the environment. So the environment is the is the invisible hand that shapes our behavior and shapes literally every human behavior uh, because every habit is really context dependent. This is something that was found out uh, first in 1936 by the psychologist by the name of Kurt Lewin, uh, which wrote, wrote a simple equation that behavior is a function of the person in their environment. And then in 1952, this principle was then um, brought into the economy world by the economist Hawking Stern, who described the phenomenon called suggesting new impulse buying, and basically triggered when a shopper sees a product for the first time and visualizes a need for it. Basically, the easier it is for a product to be reached or to be seen, the more likely we are to buy it, especially if there is that novelty um, to it. And again, this is something that we see every day, like, in every shop or supermarket even you know when new products are placed at the very beginning at the very entrance um or new clothes are placed in the in the in the windows of, of shops um and again or new collection are placed literally the entrance of the clothes that you go to of the shop sorry that you go to to buy clothes um and the same goes as I said with food um Again, there was an example of a, of a of a study of an experiment, which I don't remember from who and from where, but essentially they, they did an experiment by placing apples um, to somebody sitting to a sofa, placing apples next to the sofa and placing cookies in the kitchen that he had to the person had to go and reach and get up and reach to them. The or in or they were in another room, the person decided to go for the apples which were next to uh, next to the sofa, next to where he was sitting or he or she was sitting rather than having to get up and, and go and get and getting a cookie. So again, the the easier the, 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 the more I reach something is, the easier it is that we that we go and get it essentially. And this, as I said, is related to any really um any context as we can see both with food, with shopping and and whatnot. So the cues that trigger habit can start out um, very, very specific, but over time, um, our habits can become associated not just with a single trigger, but with the entire context. And that's why, as I said, like every habit is context dependent and the environment shapes our habits in such a powerful and incredible, um, incredible way. So the power of context explains that the habits can be easier to change in new environments. In fact, when we... Um, when we change environment, for example, when we move out, when we move city, we are much more likely to to uptake new habits in that period of time, just because again we are in a new environment. Um, so something that we can suggest here, for example, if uh, if we're trying to eat healthier, we might be uh, more often than not shopping into an autopilot mode because we go to the always supermarket, to always the same supermarket, we buy always the same foods. And again, this is something I'm guilty of it too. Uh, I always, I always shop in autopilot. This is something I've been trying to switch out of it for the last few weeks, but it's something that I've noticed myself doing it in quite a lot of times. Um, so if you're trying to eat healthy, you might want to try out a new grocery store just because again, you are less likely to shop in an wallet. In fact, you're much more likely to have to uh, think and to look around to see what's actually in you. So um, another important point to say is that bad, bad habits, or what it can be referred to as a bad habit, are auto-catalytic. So the process feeds themselves. They, they, feed, they feed themselves, essentially. So we eat junk food. If we feel bad, we feel bad, we eat more junk food, and obviously we feel more bad, and then we eat more junk food. So again, you um you see how this is how this is essentially triggering itself and it's like a um a very vicious cycle. 
Um, so we um, we can break the habit, but not the cue that triggers it. Um, and that is because because we it's very difficult to forget a cue that triggers a habit. So we can try and forget the habit, but the cue, because we are most likely not even um, able to uh, notice it, is really difficult to get rid of. Um, and that's why simply resisting to adaptation is very hard, if not impossible and also quite ineffective. So it is hard to maintain it in a, Either you know we can try and resist temptations for for a short period of times, and you know in certain situations. But again, it is very hard to maintain a normal life when it's filled in with temptations, and most of them that we don't even realize. And again, we go back to the power of of the environment and the cues that come from the environment that we um we might not even realize, we might might not even be aware of. So a more reliable approach is then to cut off the habits or the bad habits, I should say, and the source. So we need to try and reduce the exposures to the cues. And something that I like doing when I'm thinking of this process and something that I highly, highly recommend to people and, and try and educate my clients to it is that I... Um, when I'm in, when we are in a, in a similar situation or scenario, there are three main questions that I ask myself and then I want my clients to ask themselves too is that is the and there's are the follow are the following questions. Have I done everything I could? Have I done my best and have I wasted time somewhere? Because self-control is a short-term strategy and it's not a long-term one and you may be able as I said to resist temptation, but you can create the willpower necessary to override your desires every time. Okay, so we need to um, try and figure out a way where we can actually be less and less exposed to the cues rather than having to constantly rely on willpower and self-control to resist the cues, okay? So um, next point is to try and make habits irresistible. As, as we said, one of the, one of the four uh, laws of behavior change that the author speaks about in the book is that how habits need to become irresistible. Um, but first and foremost, um, we are, as humans, prone to fall for exaggerated versions of, of, of reality. And for example, um, one very easy example to make is the example of junk food, which drives our reward system into a frenzy like if it was a drug. Um, because after spending hundreds of thousands of years hunting and foraging for food in scarcity in the wild, the human brain, obviously how human brain has evolved to, to place a very high value on foods high in um, salt, sugar, and fat. So highly palatable foods are going to be very rewarding for our brain because, again, they go and trigger our ancient instinct to try and um, survive, essentially. These foods are, unfortunately, very high in calories, um, and they are... Something that were obviously quite rare when uh, when our ancestors were trying to survive, but they are very common and and easy to access uh, everywhere in in our society, and especially again in big cities like the one that I live in right now. Um, so essentially, go and trigger our 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 survival for instinct for instinct. Um, because our, we are still wired in the same way as our ancestors were, where we, or oh, they didn't know exactly where or where our, their next meal was coming from. Therefore, any time that they had the occasion, they would eat as much as possible. Um, and that was an excellent, trans successful um, strategy uh, for survival. But again, uh, our brain keeps... Um, craving the food the same way um, as it was still that scarce. But unfortunately, I mean, this food cravings is not very advantageous for our health in our society because the modern, obviously, the modern environment is not the same. And also the modern food industry relies a lot on our, on our very ancient instincts um, and our, on our evolutionary um, um, needs, essentially. 
So, uh, in fact, if we talk a bit more about this subject, if we go a little bit more in depth, we figure out that obviously one of the primary goals of food science is to create products that are very attractive, then um, that they get more and more attractive to consumers. And food scientists themselves are always on a mission to try and, and find a right combination of, again, sugar, salts, and fat to excite our brain as much as possible and to keep us coming back for more. They're essentially like delivering a drug to our brain, um, but into in, in, in a legal way, essentially. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there are a lot of things that have been made extremely attractive. It's not just foods. It's not just the food environment. Um, social medias, for example, advertisements, store mannequins, even everything have, um, everything has a role in playing these exaggerated features um, and this exaggerated version of reality that is very attractive to us and is very attractive to our um, deeply embedded, deeply ingrained in our survival instincts or ancient instincts, however you want to call it. Um, and they literally make us or make our brain goes wild and driving us into excessive, you know, eating habits, chubby habits, um, social media habits, gambling and, and, and whatnot. So habits are driven by the, this is because essentially habits are driven by the boys called the dopamine feedback loop, which means that every behavior, every habit is highly, um, sorry, every behavior is highly habit forming. For example, again, eating junk food, playing video games, browsing social media, even taking drugs. Um, these are all behaviors associated with the high levels of dopamine. And again, the same can be said also for much more common and habitual behavior, such as, for example, again, eating food or drinking water, or even going for a walk. Um, now, uh, it used to be thought that dopamine was all about the release of pleasure or the achievement of pleasure, but now we know that it's actually not all about pleasure. In fact, it, dopamine plays a central role in many neurological processes, including motivation, including learning, memory, punishment, aversion, and also voluntary movement. Um, so it works essentially much better when there is a prediction of an opportunity that will be rewarding. Um, in fact, this is when, this is called the dopamine spike or the anticipation of the dopamine spike. So essentially, um, dopamine is much more likely to spike when we feel that something will be rewarding somewhere down the future, okay? Something but somewhere near, okay? also, because again, those must not be confused. And again, this is a very simple example of the addiction to gambling of gamblers that find the um, enhancement of their behavior from the um, possibility of reward and not from the reward themselves. In fact, the act of gambling is is the reward for 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 the for the gamblers uh, and it's not the fact that they are gonna win or lose in fact most of them are not they only um so again the anticipation of the reward not the fulfillment of it is that was is that's that's what gets us to action essentially as i said like the gamblers um are the um probably the most simple example that we can make and the most easy to understand example um and then again, we go um, and explore a bit more how um, not just much only the physical environment, but also the social environment shape our, our actions, our habits, and our behaviors. Because essentially, we don't choose our earliest habits. We just, we just imitate them because we are social creatures. We are social animals. Um, so we follow the script that I handed down first and foremost by our family by culture, by society at large, by local community, and then from our school, friends, church, and, and whatnot, essentially. And these social norms are like invisible roots that guide our behavior each day. Um, we tend to um, imitate, obviously, the group because we want to belong. And obviously, if you grow up in a, in a family or in an environment, in a social environment that rewards you for your skills, then obviously, doing the skills and keep doing the skills is going to be very attractive for you. Um, it's going to be a very attractive thing for you to do. And again, the author goes on to saying that we 
have essentially three main groups that we try and imitate. We imitate the clothes. Uh, so essentially it means that we keep habits, we keep we pick up habits from the people that are around us. We imitate the many. So again, the human mind wants to belong and wants to get along with others. So we're gonna basically do what most people do. Um and we're gonna go with the crowd. Um and then last but not least, we imitate the powerful. So you, as humans, we pursue everywhere prestige, power, and status. We want to be recognized, praised, and acknowledged. And this is one of the reasons why we care so much of the you know, habits of effective or highly effective people. And we try to copy those people because we desire the success and the results that they have. Um, so these are the three main things. And we go on to talk about cravings. Where do cravings come from? Um, and again, this is something quite important. And again, this is something that very easy to um, to report to the words of eating and of overeating and of eating too much. So essentially every behavior has a surface level craving and a deeper underlying motive and sense practically Every human, every human being, every person has got the same underlying motive, which are still the same that we used to have. Again, they didn't change. Uh, the only difference is obviously um, these ancient desires are just going to have more than their solution. So it's just a, a different version of, of what we used to what we used to have, what we used to do. But the the, the desires are still the same. Um, and again, a craving is just as a um, specific manifestation of, of a deeper motive. And our brain, for example, did not evolve to desire uh, to smoke cigarettes or to eat junk food. But um, at a deeper level, our brain still wants the same thing. So reduce uncertainty, relieve anxiety, uh, win social acceptance, you know, or approval, or achieve status, or, or, or just again simple thing or reproduce itself yeah um so again um habits are modern day solutions to ancient desires and essentially new versions of old vices we see a cue we characterize it and uh, based on past experience and determine determine the appropriate response and this again it all happens in an instant and we don't pay attention to it we don't even realize it but it does play uh, it does play a crucial role in, in our habits because again, every action is preceded by a prediction. We do feel that life is reactive, um, but it is instead really predictive. Uh, so these predictions lead to, to feelings. And again, this is something that we typically describe as a craving, and which, which is essentially a feeling, a desire, an urge. And then the feelings and the emotions transform these cues that we perceive and the predictions that we make into a signal that we can apply. So a craving is the a craving is the sense that something is missing, is the sense to change our internal state. So um, what this means is essentially that obviously cravings are essentially very embedded into our nature and are also very responsive to the cues that we receive and to the internal state. So as I said, like feelings and emotions transform these cues that we perceive and we make them into a signal that we can apply. So again, very important to take all of this into consideration is that the environment, the social, um, the social pressure or the social, you know, structure that we have around us. So the cues that we get into contact with, and then the responses and to these cues that we might not even realize are there, and the um, the feelings and emotions that transform these cues. So they they almost form as a lens. Um, for which we 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 feel this cue and when we transform it into something that we do. Um, I think this is really important and it's something that's really worth um, really worth um, for all of us to 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 go and to try and, and consider where um, and how these cues in in everyday life can do share uh, a very big important part into our you know to, into our decision making into our processes of choosing and developing habits and, and choosing the behaviors and the actions then we go on and take so um moving on it is important to um again uh, find a way to um to essentially get on with change 
Uh, but sometimes, again, we get uh, blocked, we get stuck into finding the optimal or the best way uh, for change. And again, as Volker said, the best is the enemy of the good. Fastest way to lose weight, the best program could be master, the perfect idea for, you know, whatever that is. And sometimes this is because we are so focused on figuring out the best approach that we never get around to taking action. And again, the author goes into describing two different states, being in motion versus the state of taking action. When we are in motion, again, we are planning, we are strategizing, we are learning. But again, can be useful, but more often than not, is it never produces an outcome of itself. It's just a way of procrastinating, essentially. Um, then you might have the question, if motion does not lead to results, then why do we do it? Again, something I'm very guilty of it myself too. Uh, more often than not, um, we are essentially afraid of the risk of failure. We want to delay failure as much as we can. So um, so that you know this, this state of motion uh, or this state of being in motion allows us to feel like we're making progress without really risking of failing. But the, the problem is that if we really want to master something, the key is that for us to start with repetition, that to, draw, to do as many repetitions as possible, rather than focusing and trying to uh, get paralyzed by perfection. Um, again, something, as I said, probably easier said than done, and something that everyone, including myself, we all guilty of. Again, but there is a few things that we can do about this. And again, something that the author describes is the two-minute rule, which I think is very, very um, true and very important to, to, to talk about. So essentially, every day we have a handful of moments where we, um, where we have to take decisions or we have action that will impact um, greatly the, the you know, the remaining decisions that we take or most of the decisions that we take after that moment. For example, the moment between, you know, if we want to cook dinner or if we're ordering a takeout or the moment between you decide to either go to work with the bike or to take the car. Uh, these little choices, uh, again, might not feel that important there and then, but they stuck up. And again, they each of these set up us into a trajectory or now we're going to spend um, the next chunk of time and what we're going to do it after. So again, uh, something that goes back to the two-minute rule is that when we want to start a new habit, we should essentially try and make it to, uh, to take less than two minutes to do. So for example, going back to the example of reading before bed, um, instead of reading before bed becomes read one page. And again, something that it takes probably less than two minutes as well. And it's really powerful because once you start doing the right thing, maybe not straight away, but over time, it is much easier to continue. It is much easier to um, to start doing it more, essentially. And as you master the chart of showing up, the first two minutes simply become a ritual for, for us uh, at the beginning of, of a larger routine. And at the same time, we're essentially reinforcing the identity our identity of us being someone that does the action essentially. Um, so again, something that is really important. And again, as I said before, uh, when we want to master something, repetition is the key, not perfection. And again, something that lowers the entry point, like the two minute rule is really, really uh, fascinating. And again, it's something that I have recommended to people in, in different ways to, to, um, to clients, um, where we decided that obviously, um, you know, going in for a full workout was one, two, um, too heavy to face, and two, it was probably not the right thing at the time. So instead of going in with a list of six, seven, eight exercises, why don't we go to the gym with a list of one exercise only? We perform that, we see how we feel. If you want, there's this extra two or three that you can do, otherwise, you're free to go. Sometimes, you know, lowering the, the entry point can really, really be beneficial for us to try and um, essentially free ourselves from this pressure of performing. And it's something that I myself have seen in, in certain periods of time where I did not feel of training that much and just going into with the idea of having to do one exercise instead of five or six and really, really um, completely changed my outlook and made me free um, of choosing then to 
continue the session um after the first exercise was done rather than just um essentially stopping uh, after the first exercise or after or not going at all because um I found the, the the training to do was too much and I did not the energy I did not have the energy or the or the motivation that day to to perform it. So <clears throat> moving on, we want to try and make the habits not only obviously easy to, uh, or accessible or very accessible, but also we want to try and make it satisfying because we are more likely to repeat obviously behavior that, um, that reward us with an experience that is satisfying rather than something that is not satisfying. But again, this essentially works the other way around because um, in modern society, most things that we do will not benefit us immediately. Um, if we exercise today, in fact, we are more likely, you know, to to be in great shape next year, or at least to not be overweight next year. Uh, and we live in what is called the delayed return environment, where um you can work for years before you actually actually start to deliver the results and the intended payoffs. And again, our brain did not evolve uh, in such environment for such. Um, strategies and again compared to the age of the brain modern society is brand new so this is something that we always have to uh, play against and almost um, get a grip with now I'm not going to suggest how we can make habits satisfying because obviously one it depends on what habit we do and also depends on on how um, what is our definition of, of satisfying something being satisfying something not but it's something that we need to be aware of is this obviously our tendency to um, have a brain that um, relies a lot onto this instant gratification. There is a lot of instant gratifications given to us multiple times a day, every day, you know, from choosing takeouts to scrolling social media to um, to not going to the gym, to, to just staying sitting down on the sofa and watching. Netflix and YouTube and, and TV and whatnot. And uh, whilst all the other choices that we uh, that are good for us, uh, as we said before, a uh, uh, delayed return environment where we're gonna have to work hard, we're gonna have to make compromises, sacrifices, you know, time, effort, um, pleasure, you know, sacrificing pleasure because obviously cooking dinner, making it healthy, and um, not overeating and exercising. It there and then is going to feel like uh, like hard work and we might be asking ourselves and our brain might ask ourselves you know why are we doing this because we're not built to do this but the reality is that we live in an environment where if we want to be healthy and we want to um thrive we have to sacrifice something we have to compromise on something we cannot have um all the instant gratifications of the world and then also expect to be in the perfect shape or more in good health so um, something that we really need to be mindful of, we need to really be aware of, and we need to be reminding ourselves of. And now, last but not least, I want to close off uh, this this episode and this uh, two episode series on the uh, atomic habits from James Clear on how to stay focused um, when we get bored of working on our goals, because we might be able, and hopefully we will be able to, you know, get started, get going. And finally, finding you know the good strategy for us to uh, working on the goals that we want to. But again, at some point, probably we're gonna feel that this is boring, right? And again, exercise, training. Sometimes we do go through those phases. We all do. I do, and I know we all uh, humans, and so we all share the same struggles. So again. Something very interesting that the author talks about is that we think that success, and this is something that I relate to as well, because for example, you know, not just to the to the to the process of exercise, but for example, to the process of uh eating healthy and you know, keeping a diet in place, keeping good foods coming, you know, or for example, again, if we want to change uh topic, uh content creation, stay consistency into you know different social media platforms and managing you know, your own uh, structure and routines and whatnot. We think successful people essentially have bottomless reserve of passions whilst we are the only ones struggling and asking ourselves, why are we doing this and what are we doing if we're such a... But in reality, um, successful people feel the same lack of motivation as us, feel the same lack of motivation as everyone else. But the difference is that 
they somehow still find a way to uh, showing up and to keep showing up despite, you know, the feelings of boredom, despite the feelings of having enough, despite the feelings of, you know, you need to change or whatnot. So mastery essentially requires practice. And the more you practice something, the more boring and routine those will come, and then the harder they will be for us to keep going. And again, I want to close off with this uh, quote from Machiavelli, who stated that men desire novelty to such an extent that those who are doing well wish for a change as much as those who are doing badly. So we need to stay focused and expect boredom to kick in once we get going with our goals, once we get going with our routines, and that is no more, and we just need to know that we need to keep going, that that is no more, and if we really want to keep going with our goals, we need to keep going, we need to embrace the boredom, we need to embrace the whatever that is, and we just need to keep executing and keep doing the same things. So guys, I think that's enough for, for me, I think that's enough for me for today. That's enough for me for the Atomic Habits mini series. So this is part two. I hope you uh, enjoyed these two episodes. And as of, as always, I hope you took um took some um something useful out of it, and you can apply it to your own quest for better health and and better you know results in the gym or results in your daily lives or maybe combination of all. Um, let me know what you think. Again, obviously, if you can. Let me, um, if you listen to this, leave a review on the podcast house of your choice, again, in the Spotify or Apple, or if you're watching this on YouTube, again, feel free to comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much, guys, and speak to you soon.